Welcome back. In this lecture, we're continuing on with our analysis of Henry IV, Part 1, into Acts 2 and 3. And in Act 2, we get an even clearer illustration of the contrast between the ceremonial, poetic world of Richard II and the informal, even sometimes vulgar, prose world of Prince Hal and his companions. We see in those scenes carriers, or delivery men, lamenting about how there's no good service anywhere anymore. And we see scheming chamberlains and servants helping Hal and his friends to uh, set travelers up to be robbed on the highway. So it's almost like this sort of villainy has settled over the commoners. Everybody's either complaining about how things aren't good enough, or they're actively contributing to making things worse on their own. Then we have the robbery itself, which works out just as Hal and Poins have planned. And during this robbery, we meet some more of the prince's companions. There's Gads Hill, who knows that even if they get caught, they'll be safe because the prince is with them and can make any criminal charges just go away. He brags about this at one point. There's also Bardolph. And the running joke with him uh, in this play and in future plays is that his nose is like a lantern. It's on fire because he's such an alcoholic that all the blood vessels in his nose have burst. And so it looks red. And if you've ever seen someone who's really drunk, uh, you might notice that their face and their nose gets flushed. And if they drink frequently, uh, that flush sometimes doesn't go away. So that's uh, what all the joking around with Bardolph means. And finally, there's Pedo, uh, and we don't hear too much about him. Uh, anyway, all of these men uh, run away when Hal and Poins, who are disguised, remember, set on them to steal the money that they've just stolen from the travelers. Falstaff fights for a little bit, and then he flees too. And once they all meet back up at the Boar's Head Tavern, which is run by Mistress Quickly, who's also an interesting character, Hal and Poins get to see their joke played out. Falstaff comes in, swearing up and down that he had to fend off a whole troop of robbers, uh, that he was able to kill a couple of them, even, before he was forced to retreat, and he tells this long, elaborate lie to make himself look like the hero. And he also kind of takes digs at the prince and at Poins as well. He's saying, why weren't you guys there to back us up? And even as he's telling this lie, he can't keep his facts straight. Uh, at first, he says that he fought with two men, uh, then the numbers grow with each passing moment until he says he was fighting with 11. And then, when, print, when the prince and Poins finally call him out for his lying, he lies again. He says that he was onto them the whole time, uh, that he always knew it was them, but that he didn't want to fight back because he knew that Hal was the prince and he didn't want to risk potentially hurting the heir. Uh, <laughs> Falstaff is one of those characters who it might be entertaining to read about, but who we probably would never want to really meet in real life. Uh, he's just a liar through and through, uh, warming his way out of every situation, or trying to. The prince and the others seem to know that he's lying and enjoy it, but we know that he would take advantage of them if he could. But then, the fun and the revelry and the making fun of Falstaff are all interrupted when a messenger comes from the court summoning Hal to his father in the morning. Word is leaked, uh, and the Northumberland's rebellion is now public knowledge, so now the king and all the other nobles are scrambling to do something about this. And this is the moment, if ever, when Hal needs to put aside his hijinks and become Prince Henry. Even Falstaff is worried when he hears the news. He says, Look, you can pick out three worse enemies than Glendower, Douglas, and Hotspur. Oh, what are you going to do, Hal? But now, instead of getting serious, Hal orchestrates an impromptu play in the tavern. He says, Well, I know that my father is going to chide me when I see him tomorrow for being away from court, so Falstaff, you be my father and I'll practice and answer what I'll say to him. So they set up this play, and everybody's gathered around uh, laughing at it, and it's a really interesting scene because it seems like it's only through play acting, uh, through pretending, 
that Falstaff and Hal are able to have what turns out to be a moment of real honesty between each other. Uh, there's mockery happening all the time, but Falstaff uses this, oppor uses this opportunity to mount a real defense of his character. Because the underlying tension here is what's going to become a Falstaff when Hal becomes king. And Falstaff says, I can be useful for something. I can be trusted with authority. And Hal, for his part, tells him what he really thinks as well. Uh, after Falstaff over-exaggerates his own virtue, Hal says, Oh, okay, are we, are we really playing these roles accurately? Then let's switch places. I'll be my father and you be me. And then, speaking as his father, or pretending to be his father, Hal just uh, really rips into Falstaff. He says, Thou art violently carried away from grace. There is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man. A ton of man is thy companion. Why dost thou converse with that trunk of humors, that bolting hutch of beastliness, that swollen parcel of dropsies, that huge bombard of sack, that stuffed cloak bag of guts, that roasted manning tree ox with the pudding in his belly, that reverend vice, that gray iniquity, that father ruffian, that vanity in years? Wherein is he good but to taste sack and drink it? Wherein neat and cleanly but to carve a capon and eat it? Wherein cunning but in craft? Wherein crafty but in villainy? Wherein villainous but in all things? Wherein worthy but in nothing? And there's more going on here uh, than what's happening in his usual insults to, Fal to Falstaff about his weight and his age. Um, Hal is essentially saying, I see you exactly for who you are, and we might be making jokes about it now, but don't think that you've uh, blinded me to your faults. And Falstaff picks up on the serious tone. Um, he kind of seems to realize that it's not just a play that's going on here. And he says in his own defense that he is old, Falstaff, the more the pity, his, gray hair, his white hairs do witness it. But that he is, saving your reverence, a whoremaster, that I utterly deny. If sack and sugar be a fault, God help the wicked. If to be old and merry be a sin, then many an old host that I know is damned. If to be fat to be, be to be hated, then Pharaoh is lean kind or to be loved. No, my good lord, banish Pedo, banish Bardolph, banish Poins, but for sweet Jack Falstaff. Kind Jack Falstaff, true Jack Falstaff, valiant Jack Falstaff, and therefore more valiant being, as he is, old Jack Falstaff, banish not him thy Harry's company, banish not him thy Harry's company, banish plump Jack, and banish all the world. And then Prince Henry says, I do, I will. So Falstaff is almost begging at the end, uh, don't banish me. Don't banish me. You need me. And Hal, uh, again, in play acting here, banishes him right on the spot. He says, I do banish you now and I will banish you in the future. Well, we don't get to see how the rest of the play would have proceeded, uh, how Falstaff would have continued defending his own actions after that, because it's interrupted by the sheriff who's looking for the robbers and he knows exactly where to go. But from this point on in the play, we'll see that Falstaff starts talking about reforming his ways. Uh, talking about it is all that he does, uh, but we can still tell that something is weighing on his mind after this. In the next play, in Henry IV Part II, uh, we see that Poins has a similar scene with Hal where he makes the case for himself. But Poins takes the hint better than Falstaff does. We'll see that when Hal becomes king, he disappears quietly and doesn't really intrude himself onto Hal's uh, notice or presence. Anyway, meanwhile, uh, the, we see that the preparations are being made by the enemy. Back in scene two, uh, we meet Hotspur's wife, who is trying to get him to slow down and share his thoughts with her, uh, but Hotspur wants none of it. He's all on fire to go. All he cares about is war. 
We learn that he's even been dreaming about battle, to the point where sweat breaks out on his forehead while he sleeps, and he's murmuring battle commands as he tosses and turns under the covers. At one point in the play, uh, Prince Hal does an impersonation of Hotspur, and he says uh, something to the effect of how it's only he's had a quiet morning because he's only killed a dozen or so Scots before breakfast, not a hundreds. And we see from this scene with Hotspur and his wife that Hal's estimation of him isn't too far off. Uh, he and his wife have a teasing, kind of antagonistic relationship with each other. Uh, she insults him and he insults her. Uh, but it's clear that she wants to be in on his confidence, uh, that she cares about him. Uh, she's his wife and she's kind of hurt that he won't confide in her. But Hotspur doesn't have time for love. Uh, anything that doesn't have to do with war and with honor, he considers to be foolish and pointless. And this is evident in scene one of Act 3 as well, uh, where he's meeting up with his Confederate uh, rebels. He's being driven out of patience by the Welsh leader, Owen Glendower, who fancies himself to be some sort of magician or soothsayer. And he even starts to purposefully antagonize him, and Mortimer, his brother-in-law, chides him for it. So for all the honor that Percy or Hotspur has won on the battlefield, he has this flaw, uh, and it's bad manners and quickness to temper uh, that really seem to make him not make friends so much as he makes enemies. And this scene, uh, scene one of Act 3, also affords us a somewhat comedic glimpse into the marriage between Mortimer and his wife, Glendower's daughter. We heard back at the beginning of the play that this marriage had taken place, uh, and now we get to see it. And what makes it comedic is that they don't speak the same language. Uh, her father, uh, Glendower, has to interpret everything that she says to him because she only speaks Welsh. And this probably leads us to suspect that the marriage probably had more to do with politics than with actual courtship. Mortimer may have married the daughter because he really wanted to be allies with the father. Uh, who cares about trivial things like uh, compatibility or even the ability, to, the ability to understand what your spouse is saying, right? Uh, if your father or if her father has all of these large armies that you can command. But maybe not. Uh, there does appear to be uh, some affection between the two of them. Uh, his wife cries, and she doesn't want him to go away to war. And she kind of uh, pleads with him to stay longer before they ride off. So they're all drawing up their battle plans in this scene, and then they begin to set out. Uh, Hotspur, Mortimer, and Worcester are going to meet uh, Northumberland and his army at Shrewsbury. Glendower needs more time to gather his men, so he'll meet them in another two weeks. Or at least, that's the plan. And we'll see how well that plan uh, plays out in, the ne uh, in next week's readings. But the last scene that I want to talk about uh, in this lecture is the one that takes place between Hal and King Henry in Act uh, 3, Scene 2. Uh, we can see, how, or we can measure, how much like the rehearsal with Falstaff was to the real chastisement that Prince Hal faces here. And in this scene, it's interesting, uh, because it sheds light on some questions that we might have had back in Richard II. We get a bit of King Henry's philosophy of ruling, uh, and he says this. It's a lengthy passage, but I think it's worth looking at uh, in detail. He tells Hal, Had I so lavish of my presence been, so common hackneyed in the eyes of men, so stale and cheap to vulgar company, opinion that did help me to the crown had still kept loyal to possession and left me in reputeless banishment, a fellow of no mark nor likelihood. By being seldom seen, I could not stir but like a comet I was wondered at, that men would tell their children, This is he. Others would say, where, which is Bolingbroke? And then I stole all courtesy from heaven and dressed myself in such humility that I did pluck allegiance from men's hearts, loud shouts and salutations from their mouths, 
even in the presence of the crowned king. Thus did I keep my person fresh and new, my presence, like a robe pontifical, never seen but wondered at, and so my state, seldom but sumptuous, showed like a feast, and won by rareness such solemnity. The skipping king, Richard, it's a nice description of him, he ambled up and down with shallow jesters and rash baven wits, soon kindled and soon burnt, carted his state, mingled his royalty with capering fools, had his great name profaned with their scorns, and gave his countenance against his name to laugh at jibbing boys and stand the push of every beardless vain comparative, grew a companion to the common streets, and fioffed himself to popularity that, being daily swallowed by men's eyes, they surfeited with honey and began to loathe the taste of sweetness, whereof a little, more than a little, is by much too much. So when he had occasion to be seen, he was but as the cuckoo is in June, heard, but not regarded, seen, but with such eyes as, sick and blunted with community, afford no extraordinary gaze, such as is bent on sun-like majesty, when it shines seldom in admiring eyes, but rather drowsed and hung their eyelids down, slept in his face, and rendered such aspect as cloudy men use to their adversaries, being with his presence glutted, gorged, and full." So what's interesting about this passage, uh, King Henry's drawing this comparison between himself and Richard, and between himself and Prince Hal. And it seems that Hal, at least on an intellectual level, knows all of this stuff that his father's telling him. Uh, he's thought about his public perception, and how he can manipulate it. And that's evident from his soliloquy back in Act 1. Uh, but he's not doing things the way that his father would, and he's not sharing his plan with his father. Uh, as far as King Henry knows, Hal is just a hopeless, drunken scoundrel. In fact, it's even worse than that. Uh, King Henry says, offhandedly, that for all he knows, Hal might just join with the enemy for cheap pay. And it's this comment that really hurts Hal. Uh, he says this uh, in response to that to that accusation. He says, Do not think so, you shall not find it so, and God forgive them that so much have swayed your majesty's good thoughts away from me. I will redeem all this on Percy's head, and, in the closing of some glorious day, be bold to tell you that I am your son, when I will wear a garment all of blood and stain my favors in a bloody mask, which, washed away, shall scour my shame with it. And that shall be the day, whene'er it lights, that this same child of honor and renown, this gallant hotspur, this all-praised knight, and your unthought-of Harry, chance to meet. For every honor sitting on his helm, would they were multitudes, and on my head my shame's redoubled. For the time will come that I shall make this northern youth exchange his glorious deeds for my indignities. Percy is but my factor, good my lord, to engross up glorious deeds on my behalf, and I will call him to so strict account that he shall render every glory up, yea, even the slightest, slightest worship of his time, or I will tear the reckoning from his heart. So this sounds like the Hal who was speaking in soliloquy. And it's almost, even, if he's, even as he's speaking, it's almost like he's a different character from the one who is swapping insults with Falstaff and hanging around in bars. There's a very apocalyptic flavor to his speech here. Uh, redemption through blood, uh, a day of reckoning, a day of uh, judgment and atonement. And King Henry picks up on the difference. He says, well, okay then I'm going to put my trust in you, if that's uh, your plan here. And so this upcoming battle is Hal's chance to prove himself. If he can defeat Hotspur, uh, he sees it as a sort of atonement for his past behaviors. So the stakes are high, uh, not just politically, but personally as well. And we'll see how all of this ends next week at the Battle of Shrewsbury. And so finish up reading Acts 4 and 5 for then, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.